Welcome, everyone, to today's uh, Distinguished Warren Seminar. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Scott Mora. Professor Scott Mora is uh, the Claire and Schur Wenchen Endowed Distinguished Professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of California at Berkeley, where he also serves as the director of the, and I want to get this right, Contr Energy Controls and Applications Lab, or ECAL, uh, as well as the faculty director of the uh, Partners for PATH, the Partners for Advanced, Advanced Transportation, Transportation technology, Technologies. Which gets um, you PATH somehow. PATH, exactly. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Scott here to the University of Minnesota for today's Warren Seminar. Please join me in welcoming Scott. And uh, yeah, Scott, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. It's really an honor to be here. Uh, it's my first time at the University of Minnesota. I've always wanted to come and visit. I did my graduate work at another Big Ten school, so it's my goal to visit all the Big Ten schools. Um, so, so thank you for being here. Um, also, thanks for Mary, who's pulling the strings here, you know, as a top-notch producer, you know, working all the technology. So uh, today, I have a seminar in which my goal isn't really necessarily to show off any mathematical prowess, but Rather, it's uh, a project that has honestly been a passion for mine that I've put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into in these past years. Um, and I think it's quite interesting in terms of how it combines um, you know, some technical aspects that you'll see with also implementation, people, infrastructure. And it's this smart learning research pilot for electric vehicle charging stations. Um, now, just by way of introduction, Roth mentioned my lab, the Energy Controls and Applications Lab. Uh, we focus on dynamic systems and controls, optimization, now all falling within data science, and a telescoping set of applications from batteries to vehicles, automated connected electrified vehicles, up to uh, grid integrations, uh, smart grids. I also want to first give credit where credit is due. I'm just the mouthpiece, and the ones really doing the work are uh, the supremely talented students, uh, all from very interesting and diverse backgrounds, united and um, the pursuit of our research here. And those that are colored red are those that have contributed to the Slurp EV project. We'll highlight them a little bit more as we go along. Now, uh, before I get into the Slurp EV project, uh, I just want to highlight some other research areas that are happening in my lab. Uh, in case you have a connection with these and you're interested, please ask me a question about it. Uh, so just quickly, we do quite a lot of work in uh, batteries, specifically modeling, estimation, and control of batteries. Uh, so what you see on the top left is we're designing these so-called battery management systems. Essentially, they take measured data combined with mathematical models to estimate unmeasured states and parameters, which then can be used to better control the battery for performance or safety reasons. Um, and you know, today, we're really looking forward to advanced uh, battery chemistries like lithium metal batteries that have, in theory, an order of magnitude more energy density than today's lithium ion, making possible electrified freight, electrified aircraft, if you can achieve that theoretic energy density. Also, what I'm showing here is um, with a colleague of mine in geosystems engineering who's expert in putting fiber optics in infrastructure, like concrete, he said, let's put it in batteries so we can measure the stress strain and temperature in batteries. And I thought that was nuts. Uh, so we did it, because that's what, what, we, what we do when we get together. So here we got fiber optic sensors that we put in batteries to basically measure uh, particular degradation mechanisms that are, that are occurring inside these uh, lithium metal batteries. Uh, OK, also work in automated vehicles. So what I want to highlight here is a particularly interesting problem of when you're doing lane change in dense traffic. So normally, with automated vehicles, they're looking for an open space in the adjacent lane. And if it's not sufficiently open, they won't change lanes. Right? Now, there's something humans do that we need automated vehicles to do. They have an interaction. You see that person waving the person in? Is that they can sense each other's intention. How does, a ve how does an automated vehicle signal to other human-driven vehicles that has an intention to change lanes so that they understand it and maybe respond to it. There's a very human you know, interaction that occurs that, uh, for example, is necessary when you're doing lane change um, in dense traffic. And so we've 
um, develop these algorithms that use some advanced ideas, um, these uh, so-called so adversarial generator networks to try to model that interaction, so then you can do dense lanes change. The automated vehicle here is in green, and then um, these other vehicles are colored various versions of red for how um, aggressive or um, how likely they are to yield space so that you could uh, change lanes. That, um, that's work with uh, Honda. We also have a, a ARPA-E, Advanced Research Projects Agency and Energy Project, uh, called NextCar, whose goal is to reduce vehicle energy consumption by 30% by leveraging connectivity and autonomy. And in this phase two specifically, they're telling us it's got to be L4, L5 um, autonomy. So there's various demonstrations of doing arterial driving, parking and charging, and fleet dispatching. Let me just highlight, uh, just to give you a, a quick idea, uh, some results from phase one, where what the vehicles are doing here is, well, first let me point out that it's hands-on, feet off driving, okay? So that is the longitudinal motion is automated. The lateral motion is human driven, okay? So it's partially automated here. Now what's going on here is we wanna reduce energy consumption while going through the signalized intersections. It's not rocket science. Just go constant speed, okay? Braking and accelerating is not what you want. The thing is there's traffic lights. So here we have infrastructure that's communicating to the vehicle. That's what you see with this red dot is the upcoming intersection is wirelessly transmitting to the vehicle its current phase, as we call it, right? And then there's a count on timer. This is totally analogous to being a pedestrian crossing the street, where you've got the crosswalk sign that says walk, don't walk. You see it, it's got a count on timer. That for vehicles, right? And so with that, the vehicle then optimizes its longitudinal motion to minimize energy consumption. And so that's the idea. This is a test in Arcadia. Uh, in the Los Angeles area right next to Pasadena. All right, just a flavor. Um, then moving up to fleets, a huge opportunity to decarbonize fleets. This is work with the U.S. Department of Energy in collaboration with Cummings, Argonne National Lab, Michelin, and Venture Logistics. Venture Logistics is really an interesting player here. They are a trucking logistics company uh, that operates all over the country, including the upper Midwest here. Um, in which uh, our goal is to redesign and optimize the operation of the fleet to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 20%. Subject to that, minimize total cost of ownership. By replacing the diesel trucks with alternative powertrains, think fuel cell, better electric. Um, also, you can add a CAV, a Connect Automated Vehicle Package, that'll further reduce energy consumption. Um, and uh, so here, really, this work ultimately comes down to solving these vehicle routing problems where, honestly, the key challenge is that energy consumption is uncertain once you electrify the vehicles. You're very much range constrained. And if, it's a, if the weather, like between today and yesterday, drops 20, 30 degrees and you're using more heater, that dramatically affects your range. You're much more range constrained. So handling uncertainty is critical. And trucking logistics companies really don't have expertise in this. It's a, it's a huge area of opportunity. I'm also very passionate, as you'll see, about um, uh, charging infrastructure. And so uh, with some funding from the state of California, we've been looking at developing tools to model and better inform a more equitable way to distribute funds to build charging infrastructure, particularly with the Inflation Reduction Act that came out and this uh, NEVI funding. There's going to be a lot of money being poured into building charging infrastructure. I'm concerned this won't get deployed in the best way because it's going to get deployed where charging infrastructure can make money or have its best shot at making money, which largely they don't. And where is that? That's where there's Teslas, right? Which are, are just vehicles that are expensive. And where there's vehicles that are expensive, it's people who are higher income, highly educated. You know, they're technology adopters. It's not going into the communities and with, who benefit most from the reduction in air pollution. So we need better tools to sort of guide the deployment of this charging infrastructure so it actually has maximal impact um, in terms of the societal benefits. Okay, so with that, that's just a quick uh, sampling of some other things happening in the lab. I'd now like to 
give some background and introduce the Slurpee V project. So um, I'd like to start with this very famous duck curve. I love talking about the duck curve. Anyone seen this duck curve before? It's a California specific thing. Yeah, some, some of you. So I love that many of you have not because I love talking about it. It's very interesting. Um, so here's what's going on. We've got 24 hours on the x-axis, 12 a.m. to 12 a.m. On the vertical axis, we have power in megawatts. And specifically, it's the net, net power demand for the state of California. Net meaning the total electricity demand less renewables. In other words, what it represents is this is the um, supply left over after we use renewables to provide uh, to meet power demand, it's, it's the demand left over that we need dispatchable generators to track. So supply equals demand, all right? Now, what's going on here is this picture was actually created around 2012. You see the 2012 curve. And it was created in the following context. California, the state, was considering this policy of requiring 33% of power generation to come from renewable resources by the year 2020, right? So they're thinking about this in 2012. And they're trying to figure out what is the impact going to be on the grid. And there's a very concerning issue here. And the concerning issue is that if you install a lot of renewables, namely solar, which is being subtracted off here, which is why the belly of the duck is getting fatter and fatter, um, you know, we have this annoying thing where planet Earth rotates in an orbit around the sun, and therefore we don't get consistent you know, fu fusion energy. Uh, so, you know, we have to deal with this uh, diurnal cycle here. And the problem here is this rapid uh, increase in the late afternoon evening. This is the most challenging period for the state of California, right? And so traditional generators like, uh, like nuclear, coal, cannot ramp up that fast. Now, this was in 2012, and it was very concerning. Obviously, we're in the year 2022. What has actually happened? Let me show you. So, and EVs are just going to make this worse. Okay, that's, that's the point. But here's what's actually happened. So I picked some day. This happens to me in 2019. Frankly, I haven't updated this in, in a bit. But it's super easy to find a day where the ramping, you know, in these three hours from, um, from about 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., you know, here it's almost 15,000 megawatts in three hours that are ramping up. Here what was projected was 13,000 in three hours. This was a cartoon. This was not measured data. This was just a projection of what could happen. It's not hard to find an actual day where that's happening or even more extreme. So how are we doing that in California? Well, we do have a lot of renewables here. These are the different supplies. Um, the screen's a bit small. So green is renewables. And then as renewables is coming down, we basically have natural gas and imports from other states in the Western US that are ramping up. Okay? So the shale gas revolution. It was possibly necessary in enabling the integration of renewables because they're faster acting resources to help balance load and demand, interestingly. Right? So it is truly an intermediate technology. OK, meanwhile, electrification. So let's, uh, let's think about that for a sec. The evening charging problem um, is you know, on top of all of this ramping happening, it gets worse as we electrify vehicles. That is, the natural behavior of people is after a day's work, they come home, they plug in, and it starts charging. So the load is only going to increase as people come home, the sun sets, and everyone's plugging in their vehicles. Moreover, not just for balancing supply and demand and ramping, charging at night, in California at least, is the worst thing you can do for emissions. What's on the right is the total megatons of CO2 equivalent emitted per hour from all the generators in California. So, you know, we want people charging in the middle of the day when solar is coincident, temporally. Uh, you know, at night, we basically have very little, and we don't want people charging during that time. So there's a behavioral aspect that we're trying to shift here. Okay, and so, um, all right, this is just what I said. And, and uh, the opportunity here is can we control or even incentivize folks to charge at different times? And so basically, what I'm saying here, um, and these are some results from a study where we looked at scaling the number of EVs to a very large number, 
is we want to change behavior where it's something like this. I don't want you leaving home with 100% and then charging when you come home. Okay? I want you leaving home with 30%. Anyone do that with their phone? <laughs> not, not on purpose? <laughs> it's not intentional, right? Like, can you imagine? You know, I'm telling you, leave, leave your home with your phone mostly empty, okay? Your car mostly empty with charge. And then charge at work or public workplaces, right? Because this is coincident with a time where it's least emissions, you know, and we don't have as much strain on the grid in terms of uh, providing uh, matching supply and demand. Uh, then you charge up in the middle of the day, maybe up to 90%, and then you get home, you don't need to charge, right? So that's the sort of behavior we need to shift depending on the region and what are the dynamics between emissions, supply, and load. Now, you can see I'm basically saying charge away from home, but you know, it's convenient to charge at home. Well, for some people. Let's highlight some of the inequities with pollution and then we'll come back to housing stocks. So pollution inequity in the US um, is a thing. So for example, this study by my colleague Josh Apte and his colleagues uh, show us that non-Hispanic whites experience 17% less uh, fine particulate air pollution exposure than they cause in terms of PM 2.5. And blacks and Hispanics bear 56 and 63% more PM 2.5 air pollution exposure than they cause. This is largely due to the fact where people live and work, right? Is that um, for the most part, these communities are living in more industrialized areas along transportation corridors. Those are the areas that we really want to clean up through electrification or otherwise. Moreover, let's talk about income inequities, and I already hinted at this. So, okay, this is old data, but um, the point remains. So on the left, you've got essentially the distribution of US household income, right? Somewhat uniform across these bins. Meanwhile, on the right is the distribution of households that own a plug and electric vehicle of some sort, and obviously it skews higher income. So the places in which we're electrifying are not the places that benefit most from the reduced air pollution, right? So we're, we have a great, awesome tool. There's a lot of stuff in the media. You can go on Twitter and hear all sorts of stuff, but is it having maximal impact? Um, even more than that, you know, when we look at low income, middle income, and high income, here, this is a super interesting study. I love this one from a researcher from the California Energy Commission, Tiffany Huang, who looked at what is the drive time to the nearest DC fast charging station if you're low income, middle income, and high income? And of course, with uh, higher income, the closer the DC fast charging is, lower income, the further you have to drive. I'm staying in the graduate hotel, block away. The distance to the nearest DC fast charger, I looked it up, is, anyone happen to know? About 100 feet. It's like right in that parking lot. It's got, there's, like, there's this ABB unit like right in the corner. Um, that's nice. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. Um, although my, my, my Uber driver from the airport to the graduate hotel uh, happened to have a Model 3 electric car. So I was asking him a lot about how are you doing DC fast charging. And I mean, this guy was so knowledgeable. It was amazing. He knew everything about. And he was talking about we need more charging infrastructure. In, the Twin Cities area, right? He's making it work, but he's like, he, he really knows what he's doing. Um, so anyways, uh, all right. Another issue with public charging is overstay, right? So with a home charger, there's basically a one-to-one -one match between your charger and the vehicle. You're not sharing. Public chargers are shared. The problem of overstay refers to reduced utilization where after a plug and electric vehicle finishes charging, it'll just stay plugged in, essentially blocking the infrastructure. Okay, this is analogous to, although maybe not as dramatic, as someone filling up their tank at a, at a, at a gas station, you know, going inside the convenience store and then hanging out there for three hours while they're, you know, while the nozzle is still in the vehicle, right? It's very inconvenient. They're blocking usage. Um, so this is a problem. And is particularly problematic because uh, largely these public chargers are not economic today. Um, so they really need to pump more kilowatt hours. So for example, this is data from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo from a few years back where we found that the average session time was three and a half hours, but only two hours were people actually charging, right? So almost double, they were staying almost double the time they need, thereby blocking it. So we need to do something. All right, this is all built up. 
for Slurp EV. So, so here's this uh, smart learning uh, pilot for electric vehicle charging stations, where the goal is to create this next generation of workplace and public EV charging that can decrease emissions, um, you know, make the economics sustainable so we can actually have public charging, um, and decrease costs to owners. Now, uh, when we first started this project, I was presented with an opportunity to get a, a small pot of funds to build a charging station on campus and do some sort of you know, pilot. And I said, I don't want to do what is done everywhere else in the world, where they're basically just optimizing the charging power. I want to do something more, something different. And so I, what we've done that I think is interesting is we're not just optimizing the power schedule, the charging schedule for the vehicles, but also the price that we present to users. We give them a menu, I'll tell you, in a moment, and try to learn their preferences. So there's actually, the human is in the loop here. We're modeling human behavior, as you'll see. So this is truly a cyber physical human system. So let me now describe each part, because it's kind of a nice organized way to describe this setup. So the physical part of this system is, uh, you know, I, I, can, I can just barely get above the threshold and brag that I operate an EV charging network in the state of California, only because we've got eight plugs. We had eight plugs at UC San Diego and eight plugs at UC Berkeley. They're these level two chargers that are providing, ooh, this is a typo, 6.6 .6 kilowatt, not kilowatt hour, kilowatt uh, power. So 16 total, eight plus eight. That's the physical part of the infrastructure. The cyber part is all the software that we built shown here. So let me describe it in terms of how a user experiences it. You drive up to the charging station, there's a QR code that you scan, and then you're presented with this menu, and we'll break down this menu in, in just a moment. But the prices that are provided here are coming from our um, randomizer or optimizer, depending what phase of the research we're in, um, is then being sent down through this middleware to the users. The users make a choice, right? And then it'll then use the optimized power schedule, if relevant, to their choice. And then that gets sent down to the electric vehicle supply equipment, the charging units themselves. And then every five minutes, we're pulling, they refer to as metrology data. I don't like this because it suggests weather. It's really just you know, the power that's being consumed in, in that moment, along with a few other uh, pieces of metadata. So what, are this, what is this menu of choices? I want to break that down next. We present a menu of choices, and uh, that menu has two. And the first choice, regular, is your normal charging experience with any device that you use. We call it regular. And the idea is when you plug in, it starts charging at maximum power and doesn't stop until you top off or unplug, just like a phone or anything else. Okay? So that's regular. The more interesting one is scheduled. With scheduled, we ask them, OK, tell us what, what time you plan to depart and how much energy you need. And we ask this in terms of how many added miles of range do you want. So what this does is it creates constraints where we know by this deadline we need to provide this amount of energy. And subject to satisfying that demand, the user is telling us, I don't care if you start charging now, if you start charging in an hour, if you charge at a lower rate. I don't care. I just need this many added miles by this time that I depart. So if they grant this this flexibility, then what it means is the following is that you know, now their charging power is controllable. We can modulate it if we can incentivize them to pick the scheduled choice. If they pick regular, they're saying, don't touch my charging. Right? So it's something like Amazon, right, where you get next day shipping, or you can get a discount on your shipping if it comes like a week later on you know, some day where they can optimize their logistics, just like that. Now, the question then is, um, how does this work? If I want to shift load, that is, I want controllability, then how much should I discount this scheduled option relative to regular to acquire flexibility? And I want to tell you up front, I don't necessarily always want to shift load. Sometimes I just want to pump people through you know, to maximize the kilowatt hours, you know, charge immediately, full power, you know, get them in and out as quickly as possible. Other times, I want to shift them. So it's not, you know, we want to optimize depending on the time of day and circumstances. Okay. So now some data analytics from um, the actual test pilot. So some quick stats. So we've been in operation now um, two years. We had our two-year anniversary a few days ago. And uh, you can see how much energy we've delivered, the miles, and the charging sessions. 16 plugs, um, 
Well, there's more detail on that. No, these numbers are not impressive in magnitude. Not impressive. Uh, because of COVID. Because <laughs> right during this time, we told people, don't come to campus, right? So it was very difficult, actually, initially to get enough sessions. And, and, and we'll see more data on that in a sec. Actually, what I, yeah. And then, and then um, almost a year ago, we closed the UC San Diego site. And so we're exclusively operating at Berkeley right now. And I think the most important metric here actually is the number of unique users. I find that that's actually what you care about most because um, unique users will have different behaviors and different preferences. We have some power users that have come um, hundreds of times, but they basically do the same thing every time. So their sessions don't really add any variability to our data set for learning behavior. What's more interesting is having these um, more unique users. So here's the number of sessions by month, just to give you a sense of you know, the, the magnitude. And you know, it varies with campus activity, of course. So you got Berkeley in blue, UC San Diego, which um, for various contractual reasons, we had to close about a year ago. And you know, of course, uh, during the 2021 academic year, we were completely remote. We then came back in person in fall 2021. So see a jump there. Right? And then we've got winter break, summer, and usage is now going through the roof this, this fall. We are just, like, every day we seem to be setting a new record in terms of the number of sessions and energy that we're delivering. OK, so it varies with campus activity. That's part of the challenge. Also, there's a big distribution of vehicles that are using this. So um, here, you know, I'm showing you there's just a number of different models. And actually, the way to understand this is these, these vehicles that uh, are resources that you're trying to shift their load, they're not monolithic. They, they all have different characteristics. Namely, there are some vehicles, like the full battery electric vehicles that go over 100 miles or so, that can charge at the full 6.6 .6 kilowatts. Then there's other vehicles that are you know, still very much a huge part of our vehicle fleet, like this Toyota Prius Prime. Um, many of them can only charge to 3.3 kilowatts. So they are, uh, they, they are half the power capacity in terms of the resource. Then there's all sorts of other weird stuff we've seen. Um, we have someone who has an electric motorcycle, you know, that's, that's got, that charges at something like a little over one kilowatt. Then we've got some people who modify their vehicles or do goofy things, and we're, we're, we see that in the data, and we have to you know, adjust and learn, um, uh, de deal with those issues. So um, that's an interesting challenge, and of course I get excited when some new weird model you know, comes and plugs into our charging station. Okay, now. Um, what I want to do now is compare our power demand um, relative to this, in, this uh, emissions duct curve. So what I've done here is I've just selected about 500 sessions, and then I've aggregated their power demand onto the same 24 hours as if they're all happening together, um, as if like our eight plugs scaled up to you know, um, 800, for example. Um, uh, so you can see the total power demand. And the point I want to make here is, although we'll get fancy in a moment with the optimization and moving charging, is just having public charging that people can use already is doing the lion's share of the work to moving load into this period when emissions are least, right? Um, to lessen the burden of you know, uh, these other generators ramping up and down in the late evening hours. So just having public charging uh, is already doing most of the work. And you can see the behavior when people arrive. Um, it's mostly concentrated around 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Um, and then the distribution of which they leave is spread out a bit, a bit more. All right, you can also do other really interesting things, um, like if you're really excited about data analytics and business aspects and doing customer segmentation. Uh, we've looked at all the individual users and uh, here are scatter plots that are showing different characteristics, their median arrival time, the energy they consume per session on average, cost per session on average, hours per session, um, slack. Uh, uh, I'll talk about that more uh, in a moment. And then what fraction of the time they pick regular when their choices are regular and scheduled to, to really kind of cluster them in different groups. So we're using a hierarchical clustering just to see if we can you know, kind of basically group them into different categories to understand their different behaviors. So for example, here, segment A, we have users who have, they consume a lot of kilowatt hours, 
then the other two segments consume less kilowatt hours. Um, some have small slack, some have large slack. Here's what slack means. Let me actually explain it on this slide. Slack means, uh, for example, if they stay uh, for three and a half hours and they only need two hours to charge, then their slack is 1.5 hours. So it's the remaining time that we could move back and forth. It's a measure of flexibility, of shifting power demand back and forth. So the more slack, the more flexibility they have to move um, their, their loads. So yeah, what we find is that some people have, you know, you might pick schedule, but if you don't actually have a lot of slack, we can't really move you around that much. Um, so, we have these high kilowatt, low kilowatt, and some don't really have any slack. The moment they're done charging, they get out of there. Great for utilization, bad for shifting load. Then we have some users in segment C who don't consume a lot of energy, but they have large slack, so we can actually shift them around. So that's pretty useful to kind of characterize these different groups. Okay, let's now talk about finally optimizing price and power. So again, just to remind you, We've got these uh, prices for regular and prices for scheduled. And the question here is, when I do want to shift load, which is not always, but I'll tell you when, how much should I discount scheduled to acquire flexibility? In simple terms, that's what we're trying to do. So here's now where the behavioral model comes in. This is the human part of the cyber physical human system. How do we model choice? Now this is, uh, really gets you into the area of behavioral economics. Um, and transportation has done a good job of reaching into behavioral economics. Um, I, I, being trained traditionally as a control systems engineer, we tend to avoid the human, right? The human is like a disturbance. It's exogenous, it's other. We don't know how to deal with it, right? Because there's not a Maxwell's equations that or Newton's laws that describe what humans do. But it turns out that there's some interesting models that capture behavior um, that is useful. So Daniel McFadden, who, who actually um, was a professor in economics at Berkeley, won the Nobel Prize for this concept. And here's how it works. Is the idea is that each alternative, like a regular and scheduled, sorry, there's different naming convention, um, has some utility, okay? And that utility, in econometrics, they love their linear regression models, so everything linear, right? Is some linear function of some attributes and we're going to divide it into attributes you can control, price, attributes you can't control. Do I have a charger at home? What day of the week is it? What time do I arrive? Am I high income or low income? Right. So then, um, this represents the utility of any given alternative. And then epsilon represents the, the idea that people aren't robots. They're, they're not um, strictly optimizing some utility function. Rather, there's some perceived utility, and that's represented by this undefined error. It turns out if you give this error a certain probability distribution, then the probability of choosing any one of these alternatives in which the utility of one alternative j is greater than other alternatives um, indexed i is given by, in machine learning, it's this softmax function, this logistics, this, this logistic curve. Okay. Um, I think people in behavioral economics know it's a softmax in CS. I don't know everybody in CS knows this is a logistic function in these logit models from behavioral, um, behavioral economics. But anyways, so then with that, um, we now have a probabilistic model for choice. And interestingly, we can shift the distribution because we control z, the price. You know, we can, ins we can nudge in a mathematically rigorous way. And so, you know, before I show you, um, you know, some more details about optimizing with such a model, you might ask, really, do people actually respond to price? Do people care in real life? A totally legit question. Actually, I was super stressed about this because we're investing so much blood, sweat, and tears into this. You know, I was really worried that people would be like, uh, you know, I'm not going to pay attention, right? Um, and uh, I mean, honestly, I was shocked that people are pretty responsive. So I'll show you in detail. Um, we ran this experiment where we took the, the regular and scheduled prices and we randomized it. And this is just a, you know, a, a histogram showing the distribution of prices for regular and scheduled. So right about you know, similar prices on the left. 
And then on the right, we had this test period where we significantly discounted scheduled. So you see the histogram, you know, the orange scheduled bars are far to the left of the blue regular bars to see would people actually pick scheduled when we discounted it. And interestingly, during this control period, it was close to a 50-50 split, you know, 57%, 43%. When the prices are exactly the same distribution, people prefer regular slightly, right? Actually, you can get 50-50 split if scheduled is discounted something like 40 cents per hour relative to regular is what we found, right? That's, that's where you get parity. Um, but if you significantly discount, we got 80% to pick scheduled. So it's super interesting that we can modulate in certain periods and at least get, or seemingly get 80% of our vehicle population to grant us flexibility by, by discounting. But the question is how to balance, because you know, we make less revenue from charging service, but maybe we can reduce our costs. And so that's where this um, optimization comes in. And I won't show all the details, but there, there's something kind of interesting mathematically if you know, you're excited about um, some of the mathematics is, is here we're trying to minimize the expected cost where the expectation is taken with respect to the random choice of regular and schedule. There's actually a third random choice, a third choice, leave. They're just upset with all the options, both of them, and they're like, I don't want to do this. I'll charge at home or I'll charge you know, a few miles away or something like that. Right? So actually, that's critically important because if you don't include the option of leave, then the optimization will tell you, just give infinite prices. <laughs> you know, people, will, right? I mean, that's the optimal thing to do to minimize costs and maximize net revenue. But if you increase it too far, right, then you're incentivizing them to leave because actually there's another alternative. There's home or other public charging stations. So you need that to regularize. I, I didn't show slides in detail, but it's conceptually crucial. Now, it turns out, though, that when you um, formulate this, where uh, this is the probability of their choice, and this is the cost given that they made choice J, regular scheduled or leave. It turns out that um, you get sort of an interesting format. Specifically, uh, this, this, this V, which is just making more compact um, these probabilities, is a softmax function. And these H's here are biconvex. OK, the reason is because there's some interesting algorithms you can use here. Biconvex means that. Um, um, although H is not convex with respect to Z and U, it turns out if you freeze Z, it's convex in U. If you freeze U, it's convex in Z, right? So it turns out you can solve convex optimization problems super fast, super efficiently. So what this means is we can do like a round robin algorithm where we freeze one, optimize with respect to the other. Once it converges, rotate to the next one. They call this block coordinate descent. And so that's, that's what, what we use here. And it turns out that there's an interesting inequality you need because you still have that softmax function, which allows you to reformulate this. This is interesting. This equality, which is not convex nor affine, you can reformulate it into this, uh, into this, con into this uh, biconvex form. This is like an exercise from one of the optimization classes that my students take. They literally took like one little exercise from the class, and it became the core part of our algorithm. I love it when that happens. Right? I had no idea of this property. Anyways, so, so we, we leverage that, thank goodness for coursework and problem sets to solve real life applications. And then here's the type of results we get. So the first thing to focus on is, you know, we've got hour of day on the x axis. And the first thing I want you to focus on is this green curve. How's it show up on Zoom? Oh, it's pretty good. OK. So we've got this green curve, which is the time of use cost from the utility. It means what you pay the utility. And what you can see here is that charging from uh, 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. is really expensive. We want to shift load out of that period. Meanwhile, you've got these, um, these off-peak periods like 9 a.m. to what is that? 2 p.m. Um, you know, we want to put as much load there. So we want to shift load out of the peak period and into the off-peak period. Um, and we're optimizing utility cost minus service revenue. Now, the regular tariff is in gold. The scheduled tariff is in purple. And what I said is, we're trying to figure out how much do we discount, so pay attention to the delta, how much we discount scheduled with respect to regular when we want to shift load. So you probably notice that there's a lot of times where they're basically the same price, more or less, right? 
So there's a lot of times where it really doesn't matter. We don't really care what choice that they pick. We, we mostly want to funnel people through. What's actually, the intuition of what's going on here is if someone arrives, say like at uh, 8 a.m., and there's a chance that their charging load uh, could extend into this, into this trough, we're going to discount and try to get them to pick scheduled because we can delay their charging a bit to, to try to focus the charging into this trough. So prior to some drop in price, you know, we're trying to incentivize scheduled. This is happening in a more extreme way in the late afternoon. More people arrive in the morning. Um, but the, late after, the afternoon is interesting because we're really trying to incentivize scheduled um, because we're trying to, you know, if they're charging in this uh, peak period, we want to lower their power, you know, to reduce the burden. And, ho and if they stay past 9 p.m., okay, not many people do this in a workplace setting, but if they do, you know, then we could possibly delay it even after that. Actually, it's right underneath our gym, between this building and, and Graduate Hotel is the recreation center. Our charging station is right underneath. So there are actually people who do use the, our, our gym on campus who come in that late evening. So that's where their behavior pops in. So anyways, that's, that's what's going on, this, this dynamic pricing. So the experimental periods, we did this baseline um, for 23 days. Um, and in this baseline period, basically, we had everybody picking regular. We gave them scheduled, um, but it was a higher price, and basically no one, no one picked it. These, I think people, people did this by accident. <laughs> and so that, that's like your normal charging station, right? That's the baseline, the benchmark. And then in this optimized phase, we then use the optimized prices from the previous slides, and you see the different sessions. And so does this work, right? Can we actually incorporate humans in the loop by learning their behavior, optimize price, optimize power? What benefits can we accrue? So here are the economic benefits is there is a net cost reduction. In fact, um, you can increase the net revenue by 52%, right? The, the gross revenue went from about $30 per day to um, $33. And if you include this overstay fee, you can ask me a question about that, um, then, then it's a bit more. And so we were wondering, is this because we're just charging people more? Or is it because we're actually reducing costs? The answer is yes. Both. It turns out that with their behavior model, we find that there's some capacity um, that you can increase the price, and it still makes sense. It's cheaper than charging at home. In California, people are paying, can be like 30 cents per kilowatt hour. Here I heard it was like 13. Three if you have your own and have like a special tariff for the, interesting. Yeah, so don't charge at work. <laughs> You know, so yeah, different situations in different regions, and we need to like dynamically adjust depending on how policies go. So, so uh, you know, but we're also it turns out reducing costs by offering this lower price alternative that a lot of people are taking advantage of, um, and we can even more so reduce our facility costs. Uh, so that's interesting. I didn't necessarily expect that we'd improve on both sides, and this is what our net load looks like. So the baseline is in red. Right? So it's got you know, this kind of mountainous shape that goes with the arrivals and departures. And then what you can see here is that we are shifting load you know, into the super off-peak period in green when it's cheapest, and then shifting away from the peak period. Here's actually the breakdown of energy in the baseline. So the super off-peak period was comprising, uh, or had 56% of the energy. We increased that to 73%. You can see here we're really like delaying charging in the early morning to start up here at 9, um, and then moving some load out of this peak period, which is saving costs. Now, this is strictly for economics. You could do the same for, for emissions. Um, OK, let me actually skip this. Uh, we can handle that in questions uh, if there's interest. Let me say that it's really nice to do experiments. It's real. Oh my god, there is no worse evil on campus, I'm sorry, than capital projects and doing construction and all that. Like, I don't know how chairs and heads do it with like building labs and it's, you know, just putting in EV chargers on campus was. So, but, you know, you can do those real life experiments and that's great, but doing simulations is really valuable too because you can create all sorts of different, you know, scenarios. And so, we, we, we now, we also have these Monte Carlo simulations to, to um, create different randomized distributions of arrivals, departures, 
um, to get broader set of statistics that aren't specific to like, oh, spring break was during one of our periods. So that changed you know, the, the behavior. So let me close up. Uh, we talked about this EV smart charging pilot for incentivizing service choice. I love this because I'm a controls engineer by training, right? We've got controls, we've got models, you know, but there's physical infrastructure here. Um, it's also tied to optimization and data analytics, really describes the future of civil infrastructure that we want to realize. And, you know, what defines infrastructures uh, in our societies is human people, citizens, their behavior, their usage. I think we still need to better understand how we incorporate their decision making um, and their behaviors uh, into our infrastructure. Uh, and then with that, you can find all sorts of fun mathematical details that you know, can't arise. Thanks for listening. Curious to hear um, your questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Scott. Thanks a lot. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions, if there are any. I, oh, we already have our first one. And since I'm not a transportation guy, this might be naive. So as Paige said, you know, the, there's the incentive here to charge at least my understanding here, if you get your home charger, the incentive is for you to charge at night. They make it cheaper in Minnesota. And I was just looking up the power distribution, right? So California is like half renewable and then gas. And here we're about quarter coal, quarter gas, quarter nuclear, and quarter renewable. And I'm just wondering how you would translate what you're doing for California to something place like Minnesota where the this power sources are different and the current incentives seem to be different. Yeah, you know, um, that's a great question. Just to repeat the question is, how does this translate into, you know, uh, mid Midwest region? Uh, so, you know, there's all these things related to, to you know, equity and providing charging service to those who can't, can't who don't have off street parking or own their own real estate to be able to put chargers. There's that aspect that's also playing into this, but let's put that aside for a moment. Um, most of the renewable energy in the Midwest is coming from wind. And on average, there's more wind at night. So what you would like to do is shift you know, load at times when it's coincident with the cleanest energy generation, which in the upper Midwest is, as you're saying, mostly at night, right? which is part of the reason that the prices are lower at night. Um, but it may not be when you come home. right? So if we can incentivize people to start charging, say, at midnight you know, or later. In fact, a lot of vehicles have a a pretty easy interface where you can actually schedule and charge it. And that does a lot of the work, quite, quite honestly. Um, so I think that's a great solution for, re uh, for regions in which you know, uh, the, there's a one-to-one -one match. You're not sharing a charger. You know, people can be a little bit more strategic in their case and you know, shift, shift their load. You know, most of the work doesn't need to be done by this optimization, but it doesn't solve the challenge of providing public charging for those who can't put chargers at home. And to the extent that we have to do it in the middle of the day, we'd like to do it in times that are cleanest. Thanks for the question. Whoa. <laughs> uh, thanks for the um, excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. I have a few questions. Um, maybe I can save some of them for later. But let me ask a couple quick one here. Um, the choice model that you used, um, I have to look again what variables you have in the utility, uh, but the ratio of the coefficients called marginal rate of substitution yeah. is quite informative and has some policy implications. It does. So I wonder if you found anything interesting by looking at the coefficients that you calibrated and uh, their marginal rate of substitutions. For example, value of time and things right. like that. Quick answer is a little bit. We have computed the value of of time, um, we, we also have thought about if you divide a people in those different bins, how, how does that marginal rate of substitution change depending on the different categories? So we've looked a little bit into that, and they're significantly different um, coefficients. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, but we've also stopped because we, we cannot use that in the optimization, because then we're literally giving people different prices which is uh, illegal for the same service. It's like literally illegal, also not ethical, according to IRB. So, but I think it is very interesting for policy. All this data is public, and if anyone wants access, 
you can, others can look for themselves uh, when we don't have capacity if you got some creative ideas. Next question. Great. Uh, I have another question, and that's about the optimization. I'm trying to understand how frequently do you call the optimization? Is it for each customer or each time interval or yeah. maybe just at the beginning for the day? So I'll tell you what we wanted to do and what actually happened. So as is typical, you do these nice papers, all this nice theory, and then when it comes to practice, there's like, you just got to make it work. So our idea was to do it each time someone arrives. But the problem is then you have to have all this data communication. There's all sorts of vulnerabilities, like you lose connection, database goes down. So what we did was we optimized a priori for each hour of the day. So that's why these prices are indexed not by arrivals. Where, where did I have it? Not by arrivals, but time of day. So if you arrive during a certain hour of the day, then you always get these options. That's just how we need to make it work in practice. But if you make more reliable the communication from the cloud to the devices, uh, then we would want to do it each time there's a new arrival. I think I'm the human in the loop now. Is it working? Yeah. Just, yeah? It's, it's only on Zoom, I think. OK, yeah. 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 Um, very interesting work, uh, Scott. It's good to see all this all this sort of human in the loop work happening in different different domains. Um, you know, there's uh, all these interesting results from prospect theory, which have been f fed into behavioral economics as well, about you know the biases and illusions and, and how you present information to people substantially affects how they respond. So did you explore that uh, much uh, at all? I mean, just going beyond having a, a utility function, but uh, you know, even like sort of uh, the the a uh, loss gain asymmetry, right? So yeah. um, presenting information as uh, here's what it would cost you or here's what it would save or here's the money you would make or something like that. Did you explore any any variations that way? Yeah, great question. The, 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 the question is related to you know exploring concepts that are in prospect theory and different ways to present information. Um, the short answer is no, uh, because there was a high cost with our subcontractor building this web interface, which really made it hard to experiment. If I did this another way, I, I would want to do that more. We're aware of some of those ideas. I can say that, though, we've ex even with this interface and how we present information, something I've noticed is that the first few times people use it, it's a little bit more random what choices they're making as they learn what's in this interface. If you look at this and you understand it the first time, honestly, you're probably staring at it like, what does this mean? You know, it's a little difficult. So there is a notion of, um, you know, people don't have a fixed utility based off the inputs that we're giving. Uh, there's some learning that's happening on their side uh, yeah, dep based on how we're presenting information. We also have a website that shows the hourly schedule prices. And what we notice there is that people, you know, are shifting their arrival times slightly. So, so there's, there's, some, there's learning happening on their side besides us learning their behavior. There's you know, almost like a, like a game theoretic type of thing going on here. Um, so we really haven't dug into that, but that's, that's in the data, and there is potential to take it that far. Yeah, I think that's super interesting, but not much more I can say. I had a question, sort of to follow up on that. I know that with, um, with tolling, and with um, like peak hour transit pricing, there's been a lot of stuff that's shown that you know it works up until a certain degree of complexity, and then at some point it's just so complicated, and people say, "Forget it. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna drive when I need to and not adjust my behavior." I'm wondering if if you had any consider if you thought about that or if you considered that when you were sort of I mean the goal is to build something that's simple enough that people can understand it, I guess. And I, yeah. I'm kind of wondering how how you how you how you incorporated that. So the first thing I'll say, that's, that's a great question, like how much complexity or info can people process? I was very skeptical about that. And uh, you know, so it was somewhat surprising to me that in, in this experiment, we could shift you know, from 57, 43% distribution to 80, 20, just with the prices. So, so it seems that they were absorbing the, the information here. But all of that said, we can't treat these users as monolithic in terms of their behavior. So what we found is, say the fraction that pick regular, um, you know, here all these dots that are at one means no matter what we're doing, they're just picking regular. They don't want to bother. They're not processing the info. They don't care, right? So, so we do see that there is some percentage of users that just 
for whatever reason, aren't, aren't responding to the uh, discount. Um, yeah, so we certainly see that there. But I was surprised to see that th they at least were able to absorb the uh, price differences. Most were. Scott, uh, really uh, interesting, enjoyable seminar. Um, I've seen this um, article about a company that is making robots for charging. So they basically have robots, uh, you know, that go through the parking ramp, and you essentially order a charging for your vehicle, and then the robot goes to your vehicle and charges it. And so then you don't have to have designated uh, charging yeah. stations or parking spots. Um, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on how viable do you think uh, this type of, uh, you know, in terms of uh, being able to have sufficient capacity on board the, the robots and so on, right, and, and, and the cost of all that. So what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah. So, so the question is about robo-chargers. Let me actually say a little more context. Here, there's actually two things that people are valuing with EV charging, that robo-chargers fixes one of these, right? There's the value of the electrons. But you know what people value more than electrons? Is renting atoms in space. Just having a place to put their car, right? So even if I'm overstaying and I'm blocking the charger for someone else, maybe people will pay that, you know, because they just don't want to move their car in the middle of the day, right? Robochargers would address this issue, right? Because the car can stay fixed and the chargers can move around. It turns out, based on everything we've seen in this project, um, I got a one-year project uh, funded on studying this robocharger concept, and specifically not the robotics and path planning or any of that, but operationally, how would you dispatch the robochargers? How do they optimize? When you have a garage that's mixed fixed chargers and these flexible ro robochargers. I'm imagining that it might be like, you know, in a garage, you've got a rail, you know, and then there's this cord that's kind of moving across all the parking spaces and somehow can plug. I think that's a tremendous opportunity, and what we found is that when demand is very dynamic, say there's a game day tomorrow and everybody's parking in the garage and all of a sudden there's all this usage, you know, those robochargers are really effective for handling those, those, those transients if you don't have consistent demand. So creative ideas with charging infrastructure, like robochargers and this other w cool stuff, like we need as much as that, of that as we can, we can get to really you know, handle electrification of our transportation system. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Let's thank our speaker again. And Scott, we have a small thank you for making the trip, for taking your day oh. off today. Because <laughs> the University of California, Berkeley has Veterans Day off. And so yeah. for taking your day off to give this seminar, thank you very much, Scott. Wow, thank you. A small gift from Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thanks to everyone for attending today. Was this a Golden Gopher shirt? Because I was going to buy one. Oh, no. It's even better. Look at that. Look at that. It's actually very comfortable. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, guys.